think it's great. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the annual Theodore H. White Lecture, which is sponsored by the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. I'm Marvin Kalb, director of the Center. I start with a quote, not from Teddy White's voluminous writings, but from a speech on the floor of the United States Senate, delivered on March 12, 1992. The quote, as reported in the congressional record, was, the thing that has really been troubling me for the past three or four months to try to determine whether to spend another six years of my life in this place with so many fine and wonderful people, is it worth it? Can you do anything? Can you accomplish anything? Can you make the country better? Are you part of a solution rather than part of the problem? The speaker then was our speaker tonight the senator from the neighboring state of New Hampshire, whose first name, according to his birth certificate, is Warren, but for so many years now, it seemed as if his first name was Graham, <laughs> as in Graham Rudman, and his last name Hollings, as in Graham Rudman Hollings. A truly extraordinary piece of budget controlling legislation that elevated the name and the person of Warren Rudman into the forefront of Senate leadership. That was why so many eyebrows were raised back in March of this year when Senator Rudman, finishing his second term in office, first indicated that he'd had enough of life in the world's most deliberative body. To Rudman, it had become too deliberative, too hidebound by perks and privileges and politics to address the people's pressing business. But whereas many of his colleagues recognized that the budget deficit had become a hugely constraining force, they found ways, and sometimes even ingenious ways, of avoiding the challenge of reducing it. In Washington, gridlock became the description of choice. Nothing can be done became the acceptable rhetorical escape. Throughout the 1992 presidential campaign, all three candidates decried this state of gridlock. Change the Congress, the president shouted. Change the president, the Democratic challenger responded. Lift the hood and change the whole engine, came the populist cry from Texas. Come January 20th, 1993, there will surely be change. Like a laser beam, the president-elect promised, he would focus on the economy. But will those changes affect the deficit? Given the best will in the world, the best plan macroeconomists can project, 
Will the deficit have to go up before it can begin to go down? Will more taxes be required? When he announced his intention last spring not to seek a third term, Senator Rudman provided one sort of an answer when he said that the American people wanted a free lunch. And their elected representatives, both Democratic and Republican, were so frightened by political risk-taking that they refused to level with them about the economic dangers facing the country. James Madison, writing in the Federalist Papers number 10, placed high hopes on the capacity of enlightened legislators to refine the public's views and to discern the country's true interests. These days, few legislators have the courage to be inspired by Madison's vision. So often, when it is time to refine and to discern, in other words, to lead, they punt. And what about the press? One of the central concerns of the Shorenstein Barone Center's mandate. Has it refined and discerned the issues this year? Has it led an intelligent and spirited discussion? Has it truly informed? Or approaching the problem from a totally different direction, let us assume for a moment that it is not the responsibility of a free press to refine and lead any discussion. The press is there simply to cover the story and its responsibility ends with publication or broadcast of the news. To many of these questions and issues, Senator Rudman has sounded a clarion call for action. With former Senator Paul Sangas of Massachusetts, he has carried his battle to another battleground, to what they call the Concord Coalition, to push every lever to ensure a lowering of the budget deficit. Rudman recently joined a law firm with strong credentials in public policy. One of his new law partners, Arthur Lyman, who first met Rudman during the Senate's Iran-Contra hearing, said, Warren is never going to retire. I believe he will be a force in the struggle that is going on in the GOP, whether it will be a viable party or disintegrate into a fringe party. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the 1992 Theodore H. White Lecture on Press and Politics, Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire. Marvin, uh, I want to thank you so much for that generous introduction. We go back a, a long time, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to have you introduce me this evening. Let me also say that I am so honored uh, and, and really humbled to be asked to give this lecture at this institution for a number of reasons. Uh, first, I suppose I would say that Joan Barone, who I knew, Joan Shorenstein Barone, I did not know her well, but I knew her well enough to know that she was a careful journalist who took pains with what she did. She cared about getting it right. And for Theodore White, whose uh, lecture series, uh, this is in his honor, I only met him once, other than on the campaign trail in New Hampshire, where I would sit and talk to him at the Sheridan Wayfair with all of the other journalists who would be there back into the, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s. But I will never forget a memorable day in the Senate dining room. It had to be about 1983 or 1984, and my recollection may be imperfect, but I believe that Ted Kennedy, a good friend of mine, brought him into the dining room for lunch, and what was to be a lunch for two became a lunch for many. And we sat and listened to Teddy White about politics. And he certainly was in the great tradition of our journalism. For those two reasons, Marvin, I thank you and your institution thank for the invitation. <laughs> America has a new president-elect who will take up the reins of government in January. The American people, in their wisdom, have voiced displeasure with the status quo. One of the many positive aspects of American democracy is that it affords us every four years a sense of renewal. It's a fresh slate, a chance to remake what we perceive to have gone awry. So there's been much Monday morning quarterbacking and analysis, endless analysis 
of what messages were sent by this year's voters. I think it's as simple as this. Voters were angry. They knew something was wrong and they wanted it fixed. The election is over and we have begun the peaceful transition of power. We hope to move from gridlock to control. George Bush said the Democratic Congress blocked his programs, but the American people apparently found it easier to change the President than the Congress. Now what happens? What will the next four years hold for us? America has spoken out for change. We're going to get change whether we want it or not because the world is moving forward and we cannot ignore its transformation. The central question is, will we have the foresight and courage to shape this change and preserve our heritage and the dream of America for generations to come? For there is much to change. Those of you in the journalistic profession who travel America, who peer into the eyes of its citizens and discuss their dreams, must recognize this new impetus for change is rooted in distress and anxiety. Overseas, we proudly bask in the knowledge that the Cold War, which dominated so much of our American perspective during the past 40 years, has ended. But at home, we stand as a nation often splintered and ripped apart by division and difference. We struggle to reconcile our traditions of self-reliance and individual freedom with our acknowledged social responsibilities and collective obligations. It is odd and ironic that at a time of triumph for democracy, its greatest champion seems at times a nation in turmoil, desperately seeking to recover a lost sense of community and common purpose. The simple fact is, in this new era of change, our nation faces enormously difficult problems, and there are no easy answers for these problems. The great tragedy is that at a time when we face these problems, our political discourse is too often marred by prurient interest or trivialization of issues. Candidates for public office shun discussion about the tough problems facing America out of fear of losing votes or possibly the election. Instead, they serve up platitudes or speak in symbols, thereby evading the politically onerous issues. We're not talking about issues anymore. We're talking about slogans. Partial blame for voter disgust can be attributed to the recent years of shrill finger-pointing in Washington. In our divided government, where Democrats control the Congress and Republicans the White House, bipartisan cooperation was needed to achieve results. Yet it was not cooperation but confrontation that too often won out. Democrats blamed Republicans, the Congress blamed the President, and vice versa. The American people didn't know who to blame. They were frustrated by what they saw in Washington, and this year they just said no. Regrettably, the media has also contributed to the problem. The press hasn't always painted a fair or accurate picture of our nation's leaders. One national magazine prints as a factual statement that in Washington, quote, trading votes for money or pleasure is another day at the office. In a second magazine, one reads, the notion that public service might require some sacrifice has become a quaint relic. Working in government instead has come to be seen as a way to enrich oneself. I believe that most in this room recognize both statements are dead wrong and quite unfair. Such claims and attacks on the integrity of individuals and our institutions, attacks often with little or no basis in reality, end up tarring the entire system. Our political system needs the trust of people to function properly. And if people believe that all of government is corrupt and for sale, our democracy will suffer. Good people are, in fact, leaving government. The fact is, Congress is populated by enormously talented people. There are a few scoundrels, but most are honest, ethical, hardworking members. We must return the ethics debate to the real issue, standards of behavior in government service. 
let people retain their own private lives, do not make scandals out of trivialities, and avoid treating serious issues as if they were morality plays. <laughs> Candidates, meanwhile, found new ways to approach the voters. They eschewed many traditional political reporters, concentrating on the Larry King format of call-in and direct contact with the voters. To realize what a quirky, odd year it was, consider the following. The president-elect helped resuscitate his campaign by playing the saxophone in Arsenio Hall. One of the essential interview stops for candidates this year was MTV. George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Al Gore all appeared on MTV. Ross Perot appeared on Larry King Live more than he held a press conference. And Dan Quayle got into a running feud with a fictional television character named Murphy Brown. <laughs> the candidates made few appearances on the former mainstream interview shows, such as Brinkley, Meet the Press, and Face the Nation. They gave way to the immediate direct contact with the voters, afforded by call-in segments on Good Morning America, Today, and the CBS Morning News. While many in the mainstream media rue this trend, it is not all bad. While it does bypass many reputable and knowledgeable reporters, it allows the American people at least a sense of direct access to the candidates. After all, turnout this year was up significantly. People watched. They listened, they turned out, and they voted. And while they didn't get the detailed information sometimes secured when candidates are pressed by knowledgeable reporters, they did get a sense of the candidates' positions. Besides, to some extent, traditional political reporters, in my view, deserve the end run they got this year. In past campaigns, they, to a great extent, controlled the agenda, deciding what was important or significant in the campaign. But in recent years, they became swept away of focusing on the private lives of the candidate and trying often to manufacture scandals playing a game of gotcha. You gentlemen and women of the press, who Theodore Roosevelt once called the men with the muckrakes, have a responsibility to do more than simply titillate. Americans have an insatiable appetite for information, yet they also demand immediate gratification. Stories grasp our attention, the questions they generate are answered, and they fade. Teddy White's highly stylized writing underscored that all too often, how a story is told is as important as what it says. Once television pictures complemented the written press, the broadcasts of men like Edward R. Murrow went hand in hand with the written reports from men like Theodore White. But today, for many Americans, television provides the sole source of news. As a result, coverage of important issues is often presented in manner favorable to television. There is a real sense, I believe, that television undervalues the magnitude or significance of a story. It seems as though what appears is of little consequence. As Bill Moyers once put it, the printed page conveys information and commitment and requires active involvement. Television conveys emotion and experience and is very limited in what it can do logically. It's an existential experience, there and then gone. Or as Walter Cronkite said, everything is being compressed into tiny tablets. You take a little pill of news every day, 23 minutes, and that's supposed to be enough. Television is good at telling you who's ahead, who's behind, who succeeded, and who failed. Producers prefer a beginning and an end. According to Tom Brokaw, he said, it's all storytelling, you know. That's what journalism is all about. Television, with few exceptions, has not been very successful at portraying the story of our economic problems. These stories are not visual. They don't film very well. When a story is done, it simply flashes across our TV screen for a few moments, and it disappears. A few minutes later, the sense of urgency dissolves into a feature on the rise of picante sauce as the nation's most popular seasoning. In a speech this past April, the chairman of the FCC, Alfred Sykes, talked about this problem. He said, 
Our public discourse is too often defined by pictures or by the incredible shrinking soundbite, down from an average of 42 seconds in 68 to an amazing 10 seconds in 88. And what news are we treated to? Infinite replays of Rodney King being beaten by policemen in Los Angeles, nightly images of grisly disaster and crime scenes, guaranteed evening news coverage of summit meetings if they're held in picturesque locations, or heated exchanges in Congress, exchanges that are often only so much grandstanding and contain no substance. He went on to say, the lessons from these clips that escape today's version of the cutting room floor are clear. Energy, motion, props, scenery, and seemingly passionate conflict make news. The quality of coverage on the deficit has been so poor that in five ABC Washington Post polls conducted in 1990 and 1991, voters said that an average of 46 cents of every tax dollar was wasted. With that level of cynicism and distrust produced mainly by the combined failures of politicians and the press, how can we expect as a nation to address such a tough issue. The unpleasant fact is the press has missed the story. The country is at war, not a traditional war, but an economic war. I do not believe that is an overstatement, and I do not believe that I'm being alarmist. Our nation's wealth is being drained drop by drop. Indeed, our most urgent task is to address our staggering national debt and put this nation on a sound fiscal footing. Unless we face up to our obligations, decrease deficit spending, and lower the level of debt, there will be no money, no resources that are needed to address this nation's critical needs. This year, we will borrow 25 cents of every federal dollar we spend. The interest we must pay on the debt this year is $200 billion, or nearly 14 percent of the federal budget. This money is paid to those who hold United States securities, many of them wealthy foreign investors who finance our debt. In my mind, it is money totally wasted. It is not going to feed a hungry child, house the homeless, improve the quality of education, or combat the scourge of drugs in America. The numbers don't lie. This year, 47 cents of every federal dollar will go to direct benefit payment for individuals. 22 cents for defense, 14 cents for interest, 12 cents to states and localities, and 6 cents for all remaining federal programs. Our budget deficit this year was a staggering $290 billion. Not the $490 billion, however, that was estimated. And thus, using the new Washington math, we saved $110 billion. <laughs> and just to put it into some context, if we were to eliminate all non-defense discretionary programs of the government, that's everything you think of when you normally think of government, the FBI, the DEA, the EPA, student aid, the FDA, and the VA, among others, we would still have a deficit this year of approximately $190 billion. <coughs> we must end the conspiracy of silence characterizing our budget debate and be honest with the American people. I simply cannot overstate the enormous threat that our mountain of debt represents to America's future. For the past seven years, the primary economic issue confronting America has been our important attempts to achieve deficit reduction. But this is not an easy story to cover, especially for broadcast news. Up until recently, it has not received the attention commensurate with its threat to the future. Going back to FCC Chairman Sykes, he contends that a series of blind spots prevent television news from adequately covering economic news. Returning to his insights of the past, he said, quote, responsible economists of every single stripe agree that this debt burden threatens our children and our grandchildren and their standard of living. Yet television news has left our citizens poorly informed to respond in a way equal to the challenge we now face. The result, he says, on such complex issues, our primary news source leaves our democracy disabled. For without understanding, there is little hope that those who ultimately hold power in our representative government, the people, can exercise all important tasks of disciplining our representatives. 
1985 Media Institute study of network news coverage of the 1985 budget debate, the greatest budget debate since I was there, concluded that the coverage was sadly lacking in comprehensiveness and imbalance. The report went on to note, at a time when the broadcast networks are losing audience share, it seems unlikely that they will move away from the sensationalism and superficiality that have characterized their news programs, especially in recent years. Nor are they likely, they went on to say, to abandon the entertainment values that have come to shape their news productions. Thus, the prospect for better network news coverage appears dim, at least for now. I think it's safe to say that the blame for the gridlock we all despair rests in varying degrees with three groups, the people, the politicians, and the press. Based on my 22 years of public life, allow me the indulgence of offering a few observations on how to deal with this problem. The first point I would make is that breaking the gridlock and raising the level of political discourse in this country will not be achieved through new government regulations or requirements purportedly on the press. There are obvious constitutional problems with that. Nor will it be achieved through complicated revised professional codes. You simply can't fine tune the flow of information in a democracy in that way. The real solution is that the people who enjoy journalistic or political power must also accept the responsibility that comes with the power. Individual actions will make the difference. Freedom, as Clemenceau said, is nothing in the world but the opportunity for self-discipline. And so what I'm asking for here today on the part of the public, the politicians and the press, is more maturity and self-discipline in the discussion of public policy. To the American people, I would say, have said it before, it's time to start looking beyond your own self-interest. This means an acknowledgment that some small short-term sacrifice will be necessary if we are to solve the difficult problems we face. It means an understanding that government cannot provide all the solutions, and those that it can provide may take longer than a few weeks or months. Political candidates and elected officials must summon the courage to reject the temptations of focus groups and polls, as well as the pressures of their constituents. They must come to the realization that doing what is politically popular is not always right, and doing what is right is not always politically popular. I speak from some experience. For 12 years, I've had the privilege, the special privilege, of representing the people of New Hampshire in the United States Senate. They returned me for a second Senate term with a strong majority in 1986. At the time of my retirement announcement this past March, my relationship with my constituents was in good standing. But during my tenure in the Senate, I voted against weapons programs that cost jobs in New Hampshire, refused to fight the closing of a home state Air Force base, which should have been closed, co-authored a deficit reduction bill opponents warned would decimate the government, and supported means testing of popular entitlement programs. How is it that I was able to say all of this and retain the respect and, more importantly, the votes of my constituency. I believe it is because when you know what you stand for and you tell the truth and it is perceived as the truth, no matter how unpopular, the American people will listen and they will understand. It, I took great pains to answer truthfully the questions posed to me by the New Hampshire and the national press through them through you. I was able to communicate to my constituents the positions I took and why I felt they were in the national interest and thus in their interest. The English statesman Edmund Burke put it much better. He said in his famous speech in Bristol in 1774, your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. The success of political truth-telling can be found not only in my experiences, but more recently in the experiences this year of Paul Saunders. You could see the relief in the affirming faces of his supporters when Paul Saunders stood there and said, quote, no more lies. It's time for the truth. The American people are tough enough and smart enough to take it. In addition to leveling with the people, 
I would advise public officials to treat the press with respect and dignity, acknowledge their constitutionally recognized role in the functioning of this democracy. The old gimmick of using the press as a tool to advance the image drawn by your pollster is wearing so thin that the American people, I believe, are finally seeing through it. And finally, allow me to turn to the central focus of this event, the role of the press in public policy. I recognize that what I will call the mainstream press, that many of those are in a very difficult position. As forms of entertainment and news programs and newspapers are just that, entertainment, albeit enlightened entertainment, you must capture the attention of the viewer or the reader. At the same time, the business end of the news gathering has changed. Management is cutting back on resources. Bureaus are closing. Newspapers are bought, sold, or closed. And the domination of the networks is no more. Therein lies the rub, the catch-22. We have entered into a great new era of communications competition. New technologies have opened doors and increased competition. Cable has broken the network's stranglehold on television news. Today, satellites, videotape, and computer technology are fast transforming news gathering and delivery services. This new competition will increase pressure on traditional news outlets to conform. But with respect, I would say that the CBS Evening News should not become hard copy. Traditional news outlets must not shun their responsibility to strip the sheen off the facade and look beneath the carefully honed image. Beyond that, they should not forsake their obligation to enlighten the public. Much like my call on public officials to reject the tyranny of the Beltway pollster and consultant, I call on responsible journalists to reject the oppression of the news consultants, the newspaper doctors, the ratings game, and the pressure to compete. In 1960, in a remarkable speech to the Women's National Press Club, Claire Booth Luce observed that while people aren't as interested in issues as they should be, unfortunately, neither are journalists. She accused American journalism of engaging in a debasement of popular taste. She went on, the desire of the American public for more thrills in their news does not exonerate the press because it is delivering those thrills. She asked her audience, can the American press seek to be excused from responsibility for public lack of information, as TV and radio often do, on the grounds that after all we have to give the people what they want or we will go out of business? And she went on, no, not without abdicating its own American birthright. It cannot. The responsibility is fixed on the American press, falling directly and clearly on publisher and editor. This responsibility is inbuilt into the freedom of the press itself. The freedom guaranteed by the Constitution under the First Amendment carries this responsibility, however burdensome, with it. It's incumbent on American journalism to help break the cycle of gridlock and cynicism. It is your responsibility to use creativity in explaining the serious issues of our time, like the deficit, no matter how boring your consultant says they are. You must corral the great energy that is found in American journalism to go beyond the limits of your medium and educate the public about the challenges we face. In short, fulfill the true role our founding fathers intended you to play. The same year that Claire Booth Luce was reminding journalists of their responsibilities, Edward R. Murrow, delivered an address on television and politics at the Guildhall in London. As he looked to the future of journalism in the electronic age, he asked, if democracy will be able to develop the competence to deal with those complexities, if so, it must be through a broadening of education and use of communications not yet realized or perhaps even conceived. How prophetic. As a television democracy, are we mature enough to exercise proper judgment and restraint? Journalists, both print and electronic, would not help the United States solve problems like the deficit by using newfound capacities and technologies to do more stories about what goes on in a politician's bedroom. I'm asking reporters to strive for a higher ideal than simple competition at all costs. At a recent reception marking his 75th birthday, veteran CBS and NPR correspondent Daniel Shore 
who is with us this evening, confessed to having withheld a story in 1957 about the secret emigration of Jews from the Soviet Union to Israel through Poland. Shaw reminisced that his actions at the time summoned him to, quote, membership in some other group beyond just being a reporter. He observed that, quote, the older I get, the more I begin to realize that life isn't that simplicity of the young reporter saying, out of my way, bud, I want that story, and if I get that story, there it goes. I have a greater and greater sense of complications. The serious problems facing this nation are not simple. They're not easy. They're not always exciting. They do not lend themselves to easy broadcast coverage, but they are important. They are essential. And while these issues are complicated and difficult to explain, they demand attention. It will take all of the creative powers of television, the broadcast and print media, to tell this story. It's frequently said that topics like the deficit are too boring. Well, it can't be too tough. Ross Perot attracted millions of viewers with his simple infomercials, a half hour of talking head and rather crude homemade graphs. Some say the public isn't interested. I don't believe you've really tried. Thank you. Senator Redman. Uh, this is the time for questions. There are two microphones, one to the right here and one to the left. Uh, there are none, I believe, in the balcony, so come down. And while you are settling in behind the microphones, let me uh, start. By the way, when you ask a question, do identify yourself. Uh, let me just start by asking you a question concerning the cost of television in a campaign and the effect that the raising of the money, the cost of the television, has upon politics and the quality of politics in America today. And then we'll go right to the questions here. Thank you, Senator. I believe that any reading of uh, statistics of the last few years will indicate that somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all campaign dollars are spent on television or related to the production of television commercials. I have always felt with all the talk of campaign reform that the real scandal wasn't how much we had to raise, it's how we had to spend it. I recall as a candidate in New Hampshire paying $18,000 once for a 30-second commercial on a Boston television station. I thought that was rather outrageous, but that's nothing compared to what some have to spend. I believe that either we totally change the way we allocate money and let the federal government do it, which I personally oppose, or quite frankly, to truly lower the cost of campaigning and thus the influence of special interest groups, I have long been an advocate of the award of a certain number of free minutes of advertising time to candidates every two years. Without it, we'll continue going on no matter what we do. The presidential public financing of campaigns, there is two and a half times more money raised by the presidential candidates from private sources than from the public source, all through very neatly carved out loopholes. The only way to do it is to reduce the cost of television time, which is where most of our dollars are going. Thank you, Senator. Why don't you wait right here for the question here, please, your name and affiliation, if you have one. My name is Dave Gustin. I'm a uh, fellow at the Center for Science and International Affairs here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question, Senator Rudman, has to do with your, uh, what seemed to be a would seem to me to be a condemnation of the press for submitting to the degradation of competition, in effect, or degrading its product based on the, on the competition. And I wonder about that because, after all, the press does uh, compete in a constitutionally free market. And to condemn them, particularly in an era when one of the few media enterprises that is somewhat insulated from market pressures, public broadcasting, is under attack from the federal government, is under attack for being a biased presenter of news, of culture, and so forth. 
um, whether your condemnation of the of the of the uh, competitive uh, the, uh, the uh, private media is uh, is really on target. Well, for, of course, I do not accept your premise whatsoever. I don't think any reading of that speech is a condemnation of the press. That speech says, in my view, in a line, that these are difficult issues to cover. They must be covered, and you must be more creative in how you cover them. I understand the competitive pressures and thought I referred to them. Uh, my belief is that public television, public radio, obviously has clear advantages. Uh, no question about that. Uh, they may be, a, be attacked by some, uh, hardly by me. Uh, I would make the observation that in recent months, the television networks have done a rather remarkable turnabout on the very issue I'm talking about tonight. One of the examples was on the CBS Sunday morning program with Charles Corral on the deficit. ABC, on one of its featured programs, the name of which I forget, about a month ago, did the same thing. If you are creative about it, you can do it. I am simply saying that the press has not done it as they could do it because they have been frightened off by the fact that it's a dull story. I don't think it's a dull story at all that a young man like you is going to pay 25% of your gross pay in FICA taxes by the time you're 35. That is a very exciting story. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Senator. My name is Mark Goffman. I'm a first-year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, after some frustration and even alienation from both the Republican and Democrat parties, I found myself working side by side with uh, many of them and in independents in the United We Stand um, party, as you might call it. I was pretty satisfied with how we did, very satisfied, both in Massachusetts and nationwide. And now we are officially a lobbying organization. I want to. Uh, ask you to please comment on that and where you see us going and how that might relate to the Concord Coalition. Let me say very frankly that, and I've said this publicly before, that I think Ross Perot had the right message, but he was probably the wrong messenger. Uh, I believe that some of the more political skills of Mr. Perot delivering that same message might have done extraordinarily well beyond anyone's expectations although I suppose I would have to admit that he would also have to have Mr. Perot's balance sheet. <laughs> I think that that movement has proven uh, wh what I have always believed, that the American people uh, will fundamentally uh, listen to reason. Now, there are large groups who won't, but all you need is 51 percent. And what I am concerned about and what Paul Songus is concerned about in this Concord Coalition is a coming generational war when people like you are going to say, wait a minute, I'm not about to have 25 percent of my pay withheld for, quote, FICA. There'll be a march on Washington. The Concord Coalition is trying to organize across this country, young and old, to recognize this issue. And you would be pleased to know that we have received literally thousands of inquiries from people who are active in the Perot movement. We have a number of former Perot chairpersons around the country who are working on this issue with us. Thank you. Question, please. Good evening, Senator Redmond. My name is Catherine Sybil. I'm the Eastern Region Political Director for the Republicans for Choice PAC, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, on Sunday morning's Eyewitness News Conference, you mentioned that you're getting involved with a coalition of moderate Republicans including uh, Governor Weld, Tom yeah, Campbell. It's hard to find these days, but we're working. <laughs> I know. Um, yesterday, David Gergen, speaking at the BU School of Communication, thought it would be better to find common ground with the religious right than to start an all-out war with them. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Do you think there's common ground? And how well, will the press play a role in the battle that you, tend to, uh, that you intend to uh, get involved in? with the uh, religious... Well, life. I like uh, David uh, Gergen. He's a friend of mine. But I will tell you that uh, I do not agree with that. Uh, I do not think that there is any... <laughs> I do not believe there is any community of purpose between my perception and many of my friends' perceptions of a political party and that of those who are attempting to take over the party and who, in fact, did at the convention. My colleague, Jack I know, Danforth... I was there. <laughs> Pardon? My colleague Jack Danforth had a great line, I thought. He said that the Republican convention 
was all inclusive. It was a very inclusive convention, all the way from Buchanan to Robertson. <laughs> uh, so my answer is no, I don't think we'll do that. Uh, I believe that the mainstream of the Republican Party believes in more centrist positions on social issues and traditional conservative positions on fiscal and foreign policy issues. And I believe that is a party that has viability. I think a party that puts the social issues first and foremost, well to the right of center, is destined for obscurity. Thank you. Good evening, Senator. My name is Nelson Ranieri. I'm a second year master's in public administration student here. Uh, I'd like to know if you could please expand a little bit on two aspects of the deficit cutting. Uh, one would be, the, would be the having to raise taxes, and the second part would be the entitlement. Obviously, they take up a lot, and they're very politically difficult to do. If you can expand on, on one, what kind, of, uh, what kind of impact they could make as you see it, and secondly, what kind of advice you would give to the president-elect on both those two measures? The uh, solution to the deficit uh, does not require the resources of a think tank. Uh, it's already been laid out many times uh, in many resolutions before the Senate and House Budget Committees. As a matter of fact, John White's plan that he put together for Ross Perot, and by the way, Mr. White is now working with us in our Concord Coalition, John White's plan is an excellent blueprint for it. You might want to disagree with parts of it. You might want to fine tune other parts. But essentially, to get deficit reduction down to approximately the percentage we want of GNP, you need to do several things. One, you have to means test the entitlement programs for upper middle income retired people. You must do that. You must tax Social Security of those that can afford to have it taxed. You must have higher initial costs for medical care for wealthier retired Americans. You must, from a fairness point of view, if not from a fiscal point of view, but from a fairness point of view, raise taxes on the wealthiest of Americans. You must do what Governor Clinton is talking about, about investment, tax credits, capital gains, those are all important. You must take the federal discretionary budget and essentially let it grow only by inflation, which is about what Graham Rudman has let it do anyway, and allow defense to con continue to decline. Now, if you could get 51 people to vote for that in the Senate and more than half in the House, you would see the long-term interest rates around the world plummet, which is really what is holding back this economy. What many don't seem to understand is that President-elect Clinton could have the most extraordinary economy in his third and particularly fourth year, did the hard things early on. What this country needs is not more pump priming. What it needs is a signal to the world financial community that we are willing to start the deficit on a downward trend. Not immediately, not next year, not four years from now, say seven years from now, but at least start it on a certain track. Now, you do that and you'll get real growth in America, real jobs in America. You won't get it with government tinkering with the mechanism. It won't work. Yes, please. Good evening, Senator. I'm Randy Shriver, uh, first year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for 12 outstanding years of service in the Senate. Thank you. Uh, the question I, I'd like to ask is uh, regarding one of the, seems to be one of the popular ways to deal with the gridlock situation right now, and that's uh, term limits. If you could offer your ideas on that. Well, of course, uh, I have never been a great fan of term limits. I self impose term limits. Uh, uh, that's another gimmick. Uh, it's very anti-democratic in my view. Uh, I think if the people of the state want to elect a particular person over and over again, uh, they should. And, and, you know, if people don't do very well there, they normally get thrown out. I could give you a whole list over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, many this year in the House. Uh, I don't see term limitations as being a particular solution, uh, unless, of course, you adopt what I call the Rudman Plan, which I have tongue-in-cheek proposed on the floor of the Senate. You really want to have what, what, what is term limits all about? Well, I know what it's all about. It's all about trying to get people not to be there for a long time so they become wedded to their jobs, concerned about re-election, fine. I've got the plan. One six-year term for everybody, every member of the House, all 100 senators, and the president. Now, there's a problem with that. Jefferson would have had a problem with that. <laughs> Takes all the accountability out. You go in there and you can do anything you want to do because you never face the voters again. So I don't think either of those plans is very sensible. I think what we have now is very sensible. When I came into the United States Senate, when I came into the United States Senate in 1980, two-thirds of the people serving in the Senate were serving in either their first or their second term. So things are changing. 
Uh, my name is Greg Gross, and I'm alumni, alumnus of Harvard and uh, a writer and also former president of the Harvard Republican Club uh, in the 19, or mid 1980s I didn't realize they had such a club here. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually had the largest membership of any political organization on campus at the time. We were very proud of that. But um, uh, anyway, um, what, we, what my question is, now that the Republicans are a minority party in every sense of the word in Washington, um, what should the Republican Party, what should the Republican members of Congress, the Senate and the House do in their relationship with the Clinton administration and the Democratic leadership? And how can the Republican Party once again, in other words, distinguish itself from the Democrats? How can it set itself up as an alternative given that the Democrats have quite successfully presented them, themselves as the party of the middle? Well, let me say first and foremost that uh, I happen to believe that we all have an enormous stake in the success of a Clinton presidency. We have a stake in it because the country truly is on the edge of serious economic problems. There isn't a reasonable economist who will disagree with that. And so I do not believe that being obstructionist in this atmosphere is something that anyone should do and certainly not my party. I don't expect them to. What I do expect Republicans to do is to keep the administration focused on fiscal responsibility, which we've heard things during the campaign, maybe they'll change, that would lead us to believe that maybe the deficit doesn't count. Heard a lot of promises made. Reminds me of Tom Foley's marvelous line, which many in this room have heard, but for those who haven't, I'll repeat it. Tom Foley, one of my favorite people in Washington, says the two biggest mistakes a politician can make is first to make a campaign promise. The second is to keep it. <laughs> so I believe, I believe that the Republicans ought to work with the new president and if they can help shape legislation through compromise, because after all there are, last count, 42 members, 43, 42 members of the Senate, that is enough to, to block legislation that is totally against what the prevailing philosophy of this party is, then I think they ought to work for compromise. If that ends up with a great success for this administration, then the Republican Party may not win the White House again in 1996, but I will tell you quite frankly, that is less important than getting this country growing economically again, in my view. Good evening, Senator Rudman. My name is Jim Quinn. I'm not affiliated, but I'd like to ask you this question. In the 1960s, we saw three presidents come from the U.S. Senate. We saw Kennedy, uh, Johnson, and Nixon. Uh, the more recent uh, presidents have all come from the governor's mansion, Carter, uh, <clears throat> Reagan, and now uh, Governor Clinton. And their vice presidents have come from the Senate, Mondale, Quayle, and so forth, uh, Senator Gore. So forth is Gore, right, I was going <laughs> to uh, I, would, I would like to ask you, do you think, think that this is, trend is going to continue, and do you think that this is also the result of the media and the, uh, probably the complex issues that are, these uh, people are facing in Washington that we're going to people outside the realm of Washington? And if not, is, uh, is this why you left the Senate? Well, let me simply say that I, I believe there are several reasons for it. Uh, I think first and foremost uh, is probably the reason that you captioned in your question. But I think one of the reasons is that governors generally doing a much better job at their job than senators have been doing at their jobs. That's what I think. I think you look around this country, you see a lot of government look right in this commonwealth, whether you agree or disagree, you know, Bill Weld has said he would do things and he has done them. And he has restored some things that people wanted restored. Look south of Connecticut and look at Lowell Weicker. I mean, an incredible story of, of political courage in my view. I believe he just received the, the Profile and Courage Award from, uh, from the Kennedy uh, family or whatever uh, foundation uh, gives that award. Uh, governors have confronted the problems. You know, they, they can run, but they can't hide. In the Senate, you can run and you can hide. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think one of the most remarkable things in the United States Senate, and those political reporters, there were some sitting right in the front row here and one with me here who have watched this little vignette. It's really wonderful to watch, and I always get a kick out of it. Because, you know, you really run because you want to do something and you want to vote for things that you believe in. You want to vote against things you don't believe in, and the roll call vote is called, and if you watch it on C-SPAN, you'll notice that the senators come down the aisle, and we all go down, Democrats on the left, Republicans on the right, and there's a table, there's a yellow legal pad there, and on that pad is written the precise amendment or the bill or whatever it is, 
and to hear the agony about casting a vote. I mean, this vote, you know, you hear the agony, what this is going to do to me back in, I won't use a state, back in X. I mean, because they know what the right vote is, but it's a tough vote. Governors don't get that opportunity. Governors can't let their states sink. They're a single person up there, and people look at them, they get more prominence, and frankly, I think they're probably better at solving problems than most members of the Senate. That's my view. Because of their training and what they've done. Which is why I never wanted to run for governor, by the way. <laughs> is, is that why, is that why uh, do you think that uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, Kennedy, I mean, those, I think those individuals probably contributed a lot in their, in their tenure in the White House because they had so much legislative experience. But, but time has times have changed enormously. The United States Senate of Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy's day is a far different Senate than today for a whole variety of reasons, which frankly we don't have time to go into today. It is a different era. There was party discipline. There were things that were done. There were philosophies that were followed. It was a different place. Penny Geis, a recent graduate of this school. You have had a long interest in bipartisan uh, work and breaking gridlock, and you've expressed some of that this evening. Are there things other than the public and the press, things that could be done within the process and within procedures that okay. would help to break both partisan gridlock in the legislative branch and between the legislature and the executive? Yes, if there's some way to institute a form of enlightened dictatorship amongst the leadership of both bodies, it would help a great deal. Uh, the best way I know of doing that is to shut down the radio television studio upstairs for a year. I mean, the trouble with the Congress today is that everyone's an independent contractor. And, you know, I've heard George Mitchell lament on the floor, I mean, in the record, that he really, to use George's gesture, said, I really don't have any power. I mean, I'm only one senator. I can't get that guy to take his hold off this bill. I mean, it's a different place. 100 people, all equal. Now, granted, the leadership is more equal than everyone else, but still they don't have the power to get it done. The problem we have right now is a breakdown of party discipline. I mean, I really believe that we were better off when parties had some discipline. Well, the parties gave people the money to run. Today, you don't go to the party to get money to run. You do it yourself. They help a little. Whole different. You look at Lyndon Johnson's life and how he did things. Many in this room know more about that than I do. He, he had a lot of control over a lot of people, and that's not all bad. <laughs> that may give you an in interview of my philosophy. <laughs> uh, Senator, I'm Joe Kaknis, a uh, concerned citizen. I've got a couple questions here. Um, the first one is when uh, Graham Rudman Holland's bill was passed. That was supposed to get us on the way to solving our deficit problem. What happened to that? Was it a failure? And to whom do you lay the blame for that failure? All right. The second. That's quite a question in itself. You really want to? I mean. Uh, <laughs> well, this, one, this one's a fun one. Um, <laughs> the uh, Paul Songus message, in, in many ways, was the Perot message and vice versa. If Perot had come to Paul Songus when Paul dropped out of the race and offered him financial support, do you think the results yeah, would see a Paul Songus presidency to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I have an easy answer for the second question. <clears throat> and I've told Paul this. I don't think he should have dropped out of the race. I think he dropped out too early. I'm absolutely convinced that one of the great things the media does give a lot, of, a lot of time, absolutely free, to somebody who has a message, who's interesting, who says different things. And I just thought he dropped out too soon. I've told him that. He may think that also. Obviously, if he had had that kind of money, it would have helped. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little anecdote about that. Uh, we have to have a little fun tonight, Marvin. Little inside stories. About Four weeks before the election, it would have been in early October, I'm trying to consume enough time, I don't have to answer the first part of this question. <laughs> <laughs> but I will answer it. Uh, 
I got a call from Ross Perot. I had had a number of calls from Ross Perot during the fall. And he said, uh, I want to make you an offer. I'm making the same offer to Paul Songus. I'm calling him now and also to Paul Volkler. I want to buy an hour of time for you on all three networks. I want you and Songus to go on and tell the American people what the problems are. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> and I said, well, Ross, uh, sounds interesting. What do you want? I don't want anything. I just want it shown at the end that I paid for it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> for someone in public life for 12 years who feels about the deficit like I think Billy Graham feels about the Bible, <laughs> that was a hard one to turn down. <laughs> An hour on ABC, CBS, and NBC. We decided not to, because we felt that no matter what the disclaimer, and he, by the way, in fairness to Mr. Perot, you can have any disclaimer you want on that. You don't support me, you don't agree with me, anything you want to say, but I just would like it known that this was an educational uh, grant <laughs> by Perot. <laughs> but we didn't do it. First part of your question, and neither did Paul Volcker, by the way, which is probably wise. Graham Rudman Hollings didn't fail. It failed in reaching its targets because we had always assumed there would be an entitlement package following it. Graham Rudman Holling never touched the entitlement programs. The, the Congress wouldn't agree to that. And I would say, in fairness, Republicans and Democrats. There was no agreement to cover entitlements. But the rate of government spending in discretionary areas was going up at anywhere from 12 to 14 percent a year up until 1985, when that bill passed, it has flattened out. It is going up only at inflation. And as a matter of fact, if you want to know the real reason that the defense budget fell, it was because of GRH, as much as any other reason. That the defense budget in real dollars from 86 on started downward. So GRH did work. But then uh, in 1990, they started to play some real games, even trying to get around what it could do in the discretionary part of the budget. Time will tell. Uh, I feel comfortable that it has saved untold tens of billions of dollars. And uh, considering my salary for 12 years, I think it's a fair return on investment. <laughs> Joe. Hi, I'm John Mecklen. I'm a journalist. I was just curious. Uh, you sort of had put a challenge to journalists in your speech, talk about the complicated issues, I was wondering how you saw the, uh, what public officials ought to be doing to make it easier for journalists to cover the deficit. I mean, you said you just turned an hour down free. All you had to do was say, I'm not really with Ross, but he paid for it. And you said no. Mm. I mean, is that legit when you view well, sure that big a problem? It was legitimate because, as you know, I supported President Bush for re-election. Paul Songer supported Bill Clinton. Uh, and both of us felt that it could be totally confusing to people. And Paul and I agreed together that we should not do that. Uh, I would have loved to have done it. In fact, I expect to go back to Mr. Perot and ask him if he'd like to do it this year. <laughs> I think public officials should speak the truth. And many do. I could name a few on both sides of the aisle. No need to tonight, but there are a number who speak the truth in their own election cycle. Not enough, but the numbers are increasing. But I believe there are some great examples of what can be done on this story. NPR has done some stories on the deficit that were remarkable. ABC did one I spoke about. Corral did one on, on Sunday morning about eight weeks ago. Very graphic, very interesting, got excellent response. So I think there's a lot you can do. Now, as far as print journalism is concerned, uh, you know, you have to use charts and graphs and things that jump out at people, but it can be done, I believe. Good evening, Senator. A former constituent of yours and student at BC Law School now. My name is Taylor Whiteside. I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, the practice in some democracies of restraining the publication of polls for a period of time before an election. You know, 
It's a great idea, but in principle, it's a wonderful idea. But I have terrible problems anytime government, under the guise of anything, starts restraining anything that isn't absolutely going to inhibit the national security. That's just the way I feel. Just against it. I mean, it just starts to be a further encroachment. I mean, if it's there, and I think responsible journalists will do what they wish with it. Uh, Television will do what it wishes. I thought this year was in interesting with the sensitivity with which it was done, but I don't want to see legislation getting into that area. That is nothing the government ought to be regulating. We'll take two more questions here, please, and then one more. Yes. My name is uh, Peter Gabask. I'm a Cambridge citizen. Um, we examined a number of things this evening. Uh, the combination of the public and the press in something you might call uh, mass adult education across the country. Uh, the politicians are facing the economy with somewhat like a, a terror. Uh, and government, as distinct from politics, um, is facing trends of super, super nationalism, a, uh, the, this equivocal um, long distance nationalism. And uh, a growth of multinational corporations and also organized crime that are larger in many cases economically than governments. Uh, now, in terms of multinational corporations are larger than government. Uh, economically speaking, well, I don't know of any one that is, but that's all right. Uh, Go ahead. In terms of the world's economic powers. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's probably reached. What is the question, sir? Exactly. Um, <laughs> In terms of grasping the American credibility or credibility for the Amer uh, American public, uh, do you think what do you think about a RICO amendment for economic crime? Uh, do you think uh, this involves the Republicans and perhaps the Democrats policing themselves? Yeah. Well, uh, for those who aren't familiar, RICO is a statute that was designed uh, for the purpose of, of closing down organized crime, racketeering, and things of that sort. It has now been used in a number of other ways as a tool of lawyers in various kinds of lawsuits. I think that people ought to be charged with crimes and they commit crimes in a tra traditional way, and people ought to be subject to civil lawsuits, including antitrust, and they do those kinds of things, and the two shouldn't be mixed. That's my answer. Right here. Good evening, Senator. Lieutenant Carl Nyberg, United States Navy. Um, I'm not a student here. You said that the press, the politicians, and the people all bear responsibility yes. for uh, the debt and deficit problem and, mm -hmm. in turn, the debt and deficit solution. What level should we hold as people, hold the, our representatives to reducing the deficit over the next few years? My own view is that uh, if the deficit isn't on a truly downward trend, and I mean truly, not due to some little events that happen like not having to spend money on certain things that you thought you had to, but I mean structurally changed so we know it's going down. The system has changed. By 1995-1996, I think, by the way, that the accountability will come in a far different way. There'll be a third party, and God only knows who'll be leading it, and who knows what else they'll stand for. And that's my concern. Senator, thank I you, want sir. To, uh, um, thank you, but first I wanted to ask you one final, final question. Final question, all right. This is going in to be your, a beauty. <laughs> now, in your speech, uh, you spoke with great affection about most of the people in the Senate. You spoke about as fine and thoughtful and intelligent people. Most are. And you said there were a few scoundrels among them. Right. So now that you're a free man and you can speak your mind, <laughs> who are they? My book will be coming out in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Senator. Very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me just let me just say that my brother has always said that his autobiography is going to be called "Corridors I Have Known," and the senator's book is obviously going to be called "Scoundrels I Have Known." <laughs> But we are all here at the Kennedy School and at the Shorenstein Barone Center extremely delighted, proud, and honored that you have been our speaker here tonight. And I think all of us, by our applause, have indicated that kind of an agreement. Thank you again very, very much. Thank you. That was great fun.